First and foremost, I'd like to thank Development and Swathi for giving me the opportunity to tell you about my research today. So the star of the show is going to be the C. elegans L1 larvae. It's largely composed of somatic tissue, but what you're seeing here, these foci are a germline gene that's being misexpressed throughout its somatic tissue. So how does this happen? This isn't good. Um, it's because this L1 larvae failed to inherit the chromatin state properly. And what we're interested in the CATS lab is how chromatin states are inherited from one generation to the next and what this means for developmental cell fates. So first I'll go ahead and hide my video so you can see my slides. And I'll get out my laser pointer. And we'll start with a warm up uh, with chromatin. So chromatin consists of DNA wrapped around these histone core proteins. Modification to the tails of these proteins can regulate accessibility to the DNA. So some marks we call active marks, they open up chromatin, they make it accessible. These are generally associated with active transcription. There's also repressive modifications that can be added to these tails, which condense chromatin, and these are associated with repressed transcription. So an example of active mark is H3K4 methylation. And in C. elegans, this is largely laid down through the help of the compass complex in a transcriptionally dependent manner. So as a gene is being transcribed, here you see pole 2, this compass complex, which includes the methyl transferase set to, chugs along and it adds this active mark. And this keeps the transcriptional memory of this gene that's being transcribed. And the beauty of this is it can be inherited through mitotic divisions and across generations. So if you're establishing a cell fate during development, you don't have to reopen up chromatin. You can maintain that cell fate um, with the help of this transcriptional memory. However, you can imagine there's some situations where it provides a problem. What about when you have to change cell fate? And an extreme example of that is it fertilization. When you have to go from uh, highly specialized oocyte and sperm to form a totipotent zygote. And you don't want all this open active chromatin, this active mark K4 at oocyte genes and sperm genes, creating this memory of germline gene expression in your totipotent zygote that needs to immediately become either a cell that will give rise to somatic tissue um, or a germline. So how do you get around this problem? Well, this is what we've been interested in studying in the CATS lab, and it's through the maternal deposition of uh, histone modifying enzymes, SPR5 and MET2. So SPR5 is an H3K4 demethylase. It removes the active mark. MET2 is an H3K9 methyltransferase, and it adds a repressive mark. So H3K9 methylation is generally associated with repressed transcription. So together, SPR5 removes the active mark, MET2 adds a repressive mark, and this is sort of what we call SPR5 MET2 maternal reprogramming. It resets the epigenetic landscape and closes down those open active areas at germline genes. So C. elegans has another problem it has to get over. So in the presence of this re reprogramming event that's kind of going through and wiping the slate clean, you also have to maintain germ cell fate. But you have to do this in the presence of this reprogramming event and in the absence of transcription, because we know from beautiful work from Craig Mello, Geraldine Sedu, and others that there's this molecule called Pi-1 that asegregates into these p-blastomeres and what it does is it prevents transcription globally. If you don't have pi-1, these germ cells start turning into somatic cells. So how do you maintain germ cell fate in the presence of this reprogramming event and in the absence of transcription? And we've got the answer to this in two beautiful back-to-back -back papers from Susan Strong and Bill Kelly's lab in 2010. And it's through the maternal deposition of MES4 and H3K36 methyltransferase. So MES4 is deposited into the oocyte, just like SPR5 and MET2. But what it's doing is a different job. It's recognizing the H3K36 and that was laid down in the parents, and it's maintaining H3K36 at a subset of germline genes. We sort of think about this as like bookmarking these genes. And this prevents them from being shut down, we think, by SPR5 and MET2. And when you lose MES4, you don't get a germline. So what has to happen to establish somatic cell fate versus germline cell fate is you have to have the balancing activity of MES4 and SPR5 and MET2 to ensure that these two transcriptional programs become distinct and you get proper cell fate specification. So the story I'm going to tell you about today is what happens when this breaks down. 
And we're going to do it in the context of SPR5 MET2 mutants that lack this maternal reprogramming. So you can't remove SPR5, you can't remove uh, K4, you can't add K9. So now all this open active chromatin what happens is it allows MES4 that's playing this critical role in bookmarking germline genes in the germ cells to spill over into somatic tissues. And now MES4 causes ectopic expression of germline genes and somatic tissues, leading to um, some severe developmental consequences, including developmental delay. So what we wanted to know, because we had hints when we first published these SPR5 MET2 mutants that there were misexpression of some subset of germline genes and somatic tissues, but we didn't know the full extent. So the first thing I did was perform RNA-seq on these double mutants compared to wild type. We also did single mutants as a control. And we wanted to look in the somatic tissue. So we took advantage of the early L1 larval stage that's almost entirely somatic tissue, and it only has two germ cells, Z2 and Z3. We also hatch these L1 larvae without food, so we expect no germline genes to be expressed in these L1 larvae. <clears throat> so we performed RNA-seq, and what we saw to our surprise is germline genes were misexpressed. We had hints that this was happening, but not to this level. Um, not only did we see germline genes misexpressed, it tended to be germline genes that were regulated by MES4 based on the uh, Susan Strom's publication in, in, in 2010. So we went into this RNA-seq data set and we looked at the ectopic expression of these MES4 germline genes. And here you're looking at a heat map where you're looking at the log 2 FC. Um, the yellow is downregulated genes, blue is upregulated genes. What I hope you can appreciate is 108 of these 176 genes that had values in our um, DE-seq experiment. Um, 108 of these are synergistically increased. So what this hinted to us in an L1 larvae that lacks SPR5 and MET2 reprogramming, this MES4 germline genes are coming on. This whole system's coming on. So we're really interested in seeing this visually. So we turned to single molecule fish to look to see if we could see this ectopic expression in somatic tissues. And we chose two germline genes, HTP1 and CPB1, that we pulled from our RNA-seq data set that were well characterized in the literature. What you're looking at in this top panel is the mRNA in wild type L1 larvae of HTP1 and CPB1. And what you can see is it's restricted to where we would expect it to be, Z2 and Z3, the two germ cells. But when we look at a double mutant, we see an entirely different story. If you look at HTP now and SPR5 MET2 progeny, it's expressed throughout the somatic tissue. In the same case with CPB1, albeit to lower levels. And this is reflective of what the ectopic expression was in our RNA-seq data set. So we can see these MES4 germline genes coming on in somatic tissues. We wanted to know what are the consequences on development? So to address this question, I just did a simple synchronized lay and I followed the development of progeny uh, and took snapshots every 12 hours. And here you're looking at a 72 hour snapshot <clears throat> of wild type, single mutants and double mutants. And what I hope you can appreciate is by 72 hours, when we look at wild type and SPR5 and MET2 single mutants, these progeny had developed happy, healthy adults laying their own progeny, but we see a severe developmental delay in SPR5 MET2 um, progeny. And what I want to drive home the fact here is this truly is maternal effect sterile because first generation SPR5 MET2 mutants look normal to us. It's not until you lose that reprogramming maternally where we see these debilitating defects. And the progeny that you see here are all going to be these second generation mutants throughout the talk today. And we scored this population for percent that could make it to adults and none of these made it to adults. But I will say this is not a true developmental arrest. It seems like at 72 hours, these SPR5 MET2 progeny are sort of like L2 stage, but if you let them crawl around on a plate until like seven days, what you see is about 4% of those progeny will make it to adults that are completely sterile. And then you see this sort of range of developmental stages. So we think this is a severe developmental delay. So we thought MES4 might be the culprit here. So we turned to real-time PCR and RNAi to ask, okay, if you see this ectopic expression of MES4 germline genes, if we're able to knock down maternal MES4, could we rescue the expression of these um, germline genes? So to do this, I picked a handful of genes from our RNA-seq that were targets of MES4 germline genes. And they were upregulated in SPR5 MET2L1 larvae. 
I also picked a handful of control genes, which included AMA1, actin one and then some somatic specific genes that we know are expressed in L1 larvae. And when we look at wild type and SPR5 MET2 mutants on control RNAi, what I hope you can appreciate is that these MES4 germline genes are all ectopically expressed. <clears throat> this fits our RNA-seq data very nicely, but we see no changes in the expression of these control genes. Now, when we knock out MES4 and the parents, what we see is all of these genes come back down and all, uh, I think nine of them come back down, eight of them come back down to wild type level. So this kind of convinces us that MES4 germline genes um, that we see ectopically expressed depend on the presence of MES4. So we wondered now if we could rescue the gene expression, could we also rescue the development phenotype that we see? So again, we turn to a developmental snapshot experiment where we're just monitoring development after a synchronized lay. And here you're looking at 72 hours after we put a control worm on RNAi. You know, the parents, we did a synchronized lay and 100% of those progeny have now made it to adults. And what we've already seen before, SPR5 MET2 mutants are severely delayed and less than 1% of them have made it to adults. But when we knock down MES4 maternally, what we see is completely different. And we know our MES4 RNAi is working great because in a wild type worm that's been placed on, the, the mother has been placed on MES4 RNAi, the progeny are completely sterile because we know it's required for the germline. But development happens somatically normally. Um, now, what we see in the SBR5 MET2 progeny is striking. Now, more than 90% of these worms have made it to adults. So, we're able to rescue the developmental delay along with other of the somatic phenotypes that we see. So, this allows us to start thinking about a model, right? So, in the absence of SBR5 and MET2, what we think is happening is this ectopic K4 is allowing now MES4 to maintain in somatic cells um, the maintenance of H3K36 at these germline genes. If that's the case, you would expect that if we went in and we looked in those L1 larvae and somatic tissue, we should see ectopic K36. So that's exactly what we did. We turned to chip seq analysis, and what you're looking at here are uh, the normalized reads per kilobase million um, from this experiment in a wild type and SBR5 MET2 at these MES4 germline genes across the gene body. So what I hope you can appreciate is while there's some H3K36 there in a wild type, although we know this is not enough to cause ectopic expression based on our single molecule fish data of these genes, we see ectopic K36 in these SBR5 MET2 progeny. So we do see this ectopic K36 at these genes in somatic tissues. Our model also suggests that, you know, in the absence of SPR5 and MET2, it's that K4 that, that allows, the ectopic K4 that allows for K36 to be maintained by MES4. So if this is the case, if we were able to reduce the levels of K4, could we also rescue the phenotype? So we did that experiment and we, to do this, we reduced the levels of K4 by knocking out or down the methyltransferase for H3K4 methylation set two. And what we saw was striking. When we knocked down set two, we we're able to rescue the developmental delay that we see in SPR5 progeny, similar to the level of what we see with MES4. So we know that H3K4 is required for this phenotype. Um, lastly, ectopically expressed MES4 germline genes that are reprogrammed, um, you should be able to go in and see some evidence of H3K9 um, in a wild type. Uh, L1 larvae. And luckily for us, while we were putting this story together, Lisa Petrella performed this experiment for us and obtained some beautiful data. And what she showed in this data is there's a subset of germline genes in particular that have these promoter peaks, these H3K9 promoter peaks. And what we did is we reanalyzed this data in the context of MES4 germline genes. And we show that these MES4 germline genes have these H3K9 dimethyl promoter peaks. And we don't see this at genes, uh, at our control genes. And here you can look at the, if you look at all these MES4 germline genes, it's not at all of them, but it certainly is enriched at many of these genes. So we see evidence of these H3K9 promoter peaks in a wild type L1 larvae and evidence of this reprogramming. So I want to leave you with sort of the way we're thinking about um, this model. And as you're building a germline, you're transcribing germline genes, you're acquiring this transcription coupled active marks that then gets inherited to the next generation. And you require these maternal deposition of enzymes to help 
reset the epigenetic landscape and then also maintain some memory of that expression. This is carried out through MES4, SBR5, MET2. So in the absence, or so in, in a wild type situation, SBR5 removes H3K4 methylation, MET2 adds H3K9 methylation, and in somatic cells, this is absolutely critical for reprogramming and repressing these MES4 germline genes in somatic tissues. Now, MES4 is required to create this sort of bookmarking of those genes in the germline so that you can get a germline and re-express those germline genes um, after the L1 larvae hatch and start to eat. We think about this sort of in two ways, this establishment phase where these hint, where SPR5 and MET2 resets the landscape. And then there's also, you have to maintain this. So there's beautiful mechanisms that have been shown somatically by Craig Mello, Chantel Wicke, Lisa Petrella, Susan Strong, Gary Rufkin. There's these beautiful somatic mechanisms that are also involved in suppressing MES4 gene expression. And we haven't worked out the timing with this yet, um, but we think that these things are working together to repress these MES4 germline genes in somatic tissues. Now, what happens in the double mutants is this MES, uh, SPR5 MET2 reprogramming breaks down. Now you can't reprogram these germline genes in somatic tissues with K9. And as a result, you see this ectopic K36, an ectopic expression of these genes in somatic tissues, leading to this developmental delay. And even in the absence of this SPR5 and MET2 reprogramming, we know that these somatic mechanisms are intact because in our RNA-seq data, there's no changes in their expression, but it's not enough to prevent the severe developmental delay that we see. And I wanna step back in the last slide and just tell you that we don't think this mechanism is restricted to worms. We think we can learn about what's happening in vertebrates and, and, and humans that suffer from mutations in these same enzymes. So SPR5, homolog LSD1, functions in vertebrate development. In fact, we started to do these experiments and we published a paper along with others in 2016 showing that if maternal loss of LSD1 results in a one to two cell rest in the progeny. <clears throat> and what this, when we RNA sequence those arrested embryos, they look like oocytes. They fail to turn off 1,800 of the 3,000 maternal genes. We can also um, look at partial loss of function of LSD1 reprogramming. And what happens in those cases, the progeny make it past this arrest, but they suffer from a range of developmental abnormalities that we see in human patients. Uh, and what we see in human patients along with other developmental problems is a severe developmental delay. So we don't understand how you get a severe global developmental delay, but based on what I've shown you today, um, we propose that one way that you could get it is if you have transcriptional interference. So as you're building a somatic tissue, if you have transcriptional interference from the wrong transcriptional program underneath of that, this maybe could cause a global delay that we're seeing in our SPR5 MET2 mutant worms. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody in my lab, including uh, uh, Dr. Katz, um, along with uh, former members of the lab, um, especially Yovan Brockett, a talented undergraduate who actually conceived the set to knockdown experiment in a class that I taught at Oglethorpe University. Um, so he performed that experiment within a week and got the data for the paper. He's author on the paper. So it tells you the power of what you can do in the classroom with C. elegans. Um, with that, I'd just like to thank you for your attention and take any questions. Hi, thank you, Brandon. That was very nice. We do have a few questions in the Q&A. And the first question is, does ectopic expression of germline genes in the double mutant require that the L1s eat? Does it require that the L1s eat? No, it doesn't. <clears throat> because the way I did the RNA-seq experiment is I, uh, I took worms that were starved. Yep. So it does not require them to eat. Wow. OK. The second question is, some MES4 germline genes are much more ectopically expressed than others in your mutants. Does this relate to what they encode or anything to do with sequence environment? Yeah, we don't know. And what's funny is we've done two different RNA-seqs now. And what we see is even the same gene in both cases in these experiments, they, they're both up, but they're up at different levels. So we don't think it, that the K36 maintenance by MES4 is instructive. It's just permissive. Um, so we think that it's, it's just the program coming on, but how you get one gene more expressed than the other, we have no idea. That's a great question. 